In this week's weekly funny story jokes, we bring you our best funny story joke compilation of the week. These story jokes are sure to make you laugh, from the first one to the last one. These are our story jokes which we love to generate. This week we bring you five story jokes, starting with a story about the pleasures of war until we end with a funny golf story joke. Please watch to the end as we keep the best one for last. So, sit back, get the popcorn, and get ready to laugh until your stomach ache. Our first joke of the day is a funny story about war, like it's never been told before. All right, folks, buckle up. Today's joke takes us to the most epic war story ever. Or at least it would be epic if I knew any actual history. But fear not, because I have a special brand of historical knowledge. Think Wikipedia after a few too many rum punches. Wink, wink. Let's see if we can unearth a funny nugget from the dusty battlefield of my brain. The Global Cafeteria Brawl, a look at World War II. Imagine the world as a giant high school cafeteria, buzzing with students from all corners of the globe. In one corner sits Germany, the resident bully, fueled by a desire for more territory and a grudge against the victors of the previous cafeteria brawl, World War I. They start snatching lunch money, resources, from weaker countries like Austria and Czechoslovakia. France and Britain, the cafeteria monitors, see this and worry. They don't want to fight, but they also can't let Germany keep pushing everyone around. When Germany grabs all of Poland's lunch, invades Poland, it's the last straw. France and Britain declare war, essentially starting a cafeteria brawl. Across the table sits Italy, Germany's best friend, ally. They're not the strongest fighters, but they love to brag and join the fight to impress everyone. Japan, another bully on the other side of the cafeteria, sees this as their chance. They launch a surprise attack on America's best friend, Hawaii's lunch line, bombing Pearl Harbor. Furious, America joins the fight, turning the cafeteria into a chaotic food fight. Tanks become makeshift battering rams, airplanes rain down mashed potatoes, bombs, and soldiers fling sporks, grenades, at each other. It's a total mess. The fight goes global. The cafeteria brawl quickly spills outside. Germany attacks the Soviet Union, hoping for a quick victory. But the Soviets fight back fiercely, like a lunch lady defending her precious cafeteria supplies. Meanwhile, Japan tears through Southeast Asia, conquering territories like they're stealing lunch trays. The tide turns. The fight drags on for years, leaving everyone exhausted and hungry, resource depleted. The good guys, the allies, including the US, Britain, the Soviet Union, and China, band together. They outsmart and overpower the bad guys, the Axis, Germany, Italy, and Japan. Detention for everyone. The Allies win, but at a terrible cost. Millions are dead, cities are in ruins, and the cafeteria is a wreck. Germany, Italy, and Japan get the ultimate detention. They're occupied by the Allies and forced to rebuild what they destroyed. Lessons learned. World War II was a harsh reminder of the dangers of unchecked aggression and nationalism. After the dust settled, the cafeteria monitors, victorious allies, created a new system, the United Nations, to try and prevent such a massive brawl from ever happening again. This is just a simplified snapshot of a complex event. There are many important details and figures left out. But hopefully, it piques your interest and gives you a starting point to learn more about this pivotal moment in history. History buffs might scoff at the spork throwing and dodgeball references, but this lighthearted approach highlights the underlying reasons why tensions flared. Germany, resentful of the harsh treatment it received after the previous cafeteria brawl, World War I, felt they deserved more power and territory. This insatiable hunger for dominance, coupled with charismatic but ruthless leaders like Hitler, set the stage for a new conflict. Just like when the cafeteria bully snatches someone's lunch money, Germany's aggressive land grabs couldn't be ignored by the established powers. This, in turn, led to the cafeteria monitors, 
France and Britain, stepping in. All right, all right, enough with the history lesson. Let's fast forward through this slower than molasses in January intro and get to the funny part already. Long after the fireworks of World War II had fizzled out, a little old man with a face redder than a borscht beet shuffled into the priest's office. Guilt gnawed at him worse than his dentures. The priest, a wise old soul with a twinkle in his eye, ushered him in. Fop. The old man confessed. Back when the whole Nazi business was going down, a young farmhand with legs that went on for miles came knocking on my door one night. Scared out of her overalls, poor thing. So, being the good Samaritan I am, I hit her. In the hayloft, of course. Kept her safe and sound from those pesky Messerschmitts. The priest chuckled. Ah, that's a noble deed, my son. No need to feel any guilt for helping someone out in a pinch. But father... The old man mumbled, shifting uncomfortably. It seems she got a mite grateful. Started showing her appreciation in ways that, well, let's just say she showed her gratefulness in physical pleasure. Happened a few times a day, and even twice on Sundays. Bless her heart. The priest raised an eyebrow. Well, those were stressful times, son. Two young people cooped up together, scared of those pesky bombs. Completely understandable. No need to dwell on it. Relief washed over the old man's face. Thank you, Father. You've lifted a huge weight off my shoulders. Just one little thing, though. Yes, my son. The old man leaned in conspiratorially. Should I tell her that the war ended 20 years ago? In our next funny story, we bring you a captain of a ship fighting of some pirates. Let's find out just how brave he really is. Ahoy there, mateys. Gather round and listen closely, for I be about to tell you a story joke that be more twisty-turny than a pretzel dipped in butter, the hilarious history of pirates. Imagine this. It's the 1600s. Europe's all a Twitter cause Christopher Columbus just stumbled upon this whole new world chock full of shiny gold and enough sugar to make your teeth sing sea shanties. Now naturally, everyone wants a piece of that treasure pie. But here's the thing. Getting your hands on that gold was no walk in the park. You had to sail these rickety wooden ships across vast oceans, filled with more scurvy-ridden sailors than you could shake a parrot at. That's where our pirate pals come in, like the original delivery dudes of danger. These weren't your mama's pirates, though. They were a motley crew of scoundrels, scalawags, and folks who just couldn't hold a steady job on land. We're talking peg-legged fellas with parrots on their shoulders, swashbuckling ladies who could sword fight in heels and probably win, and even a blind pirate named Black Bart Roberts who terrorized the seas with nothing but a good sense of smell and a mean sense of direction. Now, these pirates weren't exactly what you'd call lawful good. They were more like chaotic neutral, partiers with a plundering problem. Their motto? Why work for gold when you can steal it from someone who has way too much? Here's how it worked. A pirate ship looking all spiffy with its red sails, because who needs camouflage when you're this terrifying, would spot a nice plump merchant vessel loaded with doubloons and spices they'd raise their Jolly Roger flag, which basically said, hey, we're here to steal your stuff and maybe sing some sea shanties later. The merchant ship, being a bit of a scaredy cat, would try to outrun the pirates. Cue the epic chase scene. Cannons would roar, parrots would squawk, because apparently even birds like a good fight, and the pirates would swing from ropes like a drunken jungle gym competition. Now, if the pirates caught up, things could get a bit messy. There'd be sword fights that would make fencing look like patty cake and enough yelling to make a sailor blush. And sailors blush a lot, let me tell you. But hey, at least they had rum to drown their sorrows or celebrate their victories. Pirates were equal opportunity partiers. But here's the kicker. Being a pirate wasn't all sunshine and stolen loot. Their lives were brutal. They faced storms that could crack a kraken's beak diseases that spread faster than rumors on a pirate ship, which is saying something, 
and constant threats from the navies who weren't exactly fans of their whole stealing everything that isn't nailed down business model. So why did they do it? Well, some did it for the adventure, some for the rum, and some because, frankly, the open seas and the chance to be your own boss seemed a lot more appealing than spending your days swabbing the decks on a stuffy navy ship. You see, pirates weren't just interested in gold. They also carted around all sorts of exotic goods, spices, fabrics, even new types of vegetables. They were like the Uber Eats of the 17th century, except instead of hangry customers, they had cutlass-wielding pirates. By traipsing all over the globe and trading their loot, pirates unknowingly spread cultures and helped connect different parts of the world. So, next time you bite into a spicy curry or wear a silk shirt, you can thank a pirate for introducing it to the world, even if they got it by somewhat unconventional means. All right, that'd be enough history for one day. But before we set sail on the high seas of hilarity with our pirate joke, let me ask you this. If pirates were the original delivery dudes, what kind of special requests do you think they'd get? Stay tuned to find out, mateys. There be laughs ahoy. Avast, ye landlubbers. Gather round and listen to a tale of swashbuckling bravery and a captain who was, well, let's just say, fashionably challenged. We're sailing the high seas in the golden age of piracy, where danger lurked around every reef and treasure chests overflowed with enough gold to make a dragon drool. Our story follows Captain Pegleg Pete, a fearsome fellow with a beard that could house a family of barnacles and a battle cry that could curdle milk at 50 paces. Now, Pete wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed, but what he lacked in brains he made up for in, well, something. Let's just say his strategic brilliance wasn't exactly legendary. One fine day, Pete's ship, the Rusty Nail, was cruising along when a lookout screeched, Captain, pirate ship on starboard side. Panic rippled through the crew faster than a stowaway with a yen for grog. But Pete, cool as a cucumber dipped in rum, boomed. Fear not me, hearties. Bring me my red shirt. The first mate, a scrawny fella named Nigel with a nervous twitch, scurried below deck and returned with a bright red shirt that could be seen from Neptune's bathtub. Pete donned the shirt with the swagger of a peacock and roared. To battle. The fight was fierce. Cannons boomed. Cutlasses clashed, and parrots squawked encouragement. Or maybe insults. It's hard to tell with those feathery fiends. But Pete, his red shirt a beacon of courage, or maybe a giant target depending on who you asked, led his crew to a glorious victory. Though there were some bumps and bruises, the rusty nail emerged victorious. Later that day, another pirate ship hove into view, this one twice the size of the first. The crew, still shaken from the previous battle, looked to Pete with wide eyes. But Pete, ever the picture of composure, bellowed. Same drill, lads. Bring me my red shirt. The battle raged anew, even fiercer than before. Cannons roared louder, cutlasses clashed angrier, and parrots... Well, you get the idea. But once again, Pete, his red shirt a symbol of unwavering leadership, or maybe just a giant shoot here sign, led his crew to victory. This time though, the victory came at a heavier cost, with several injuries and a singed beard for poor Pete. Exhausted but triumphant, the crew gathered on deck that night, nursing wounds and sharing grog. One young deckhand, a wide-eyed lad named Barnaby, finally piped up. Captain, sir, why the red shirt before battle? Pete, sporting a bandage that looked suspiciously like a parrot had taken a liking to his ear, puffed out his chest and declared, In the heat of battle, a red shirt hides the blood, lad. That way, the crew fights on without fear. The crew, touched by Pete's apparent selflessness, murmured their admiration. Barnaby, however, still looked a tad confused. As dawn painted the sky a fiery red, the lookout shrieked. Captain, ten pirate ships on the horizon, all with boarding parties. The crew froze, fear etched on their faces. Pete, however, remained unfazed. He took a deep breath, then... All right, lads. 
He boomed, a hint of panic creeping into his voice. This time, bring me my brown pants. <laughs> In the following funny story, we bring you a magician who is continually outwitted by a parrot until he had enough. In today's story joke, a magician pulls a rabbit out of a hat at a party. The impressed host asks, how'd you do that? The magician shrugs and says, honestly, I have no idea. I was just trying to find my car keys. Ready to ditch the smoke and mirrors? All right, now that we've gotten that awkward silence out of the way, buckle up because we're about to take a whirlwind tour through the wacky, wonderful, and sometimes downright weird history of magic. Ever wondered why rabbits appear out of hats? Spoiler alert, rabbits hate hats. It all started way back in the prehistoric era when our grug-wearing ancestors discovered the magic of, well, hitting things with sticks. Oof, grunted Grog the nearly wise. That rock moved after I whacked it with this pointy stick. Must be magic. And thus, the illustrious career of the magician formerly known as Caveman was launched. Unfortunately, his act got a little stale after, you know, the millionth time. The audience retention for stick-based magic wasn't great. Fast forward a few millennia and enter the Egyptians. Now these guys were onto something. Hieroglyphics, magical, Pyramids? Super magical. Mummification? That's a little out of my expertise, but definitely a conversation starter at parties. Egyptian magicians, decked out in more gold than a discount jewelry store, were the rock stars of their day. They performed everything from healing tricks, though sadly, no mummy resurrection packages, to convincing Pharaoh he wasn't balding. Spoiler alert, he was. Then came the Greeks and Romans, these folks were all about logic and philosophy, but even they couldn't resist a good magic show. Their magicians, the Magi, pronounced magicians who totally stole our act, according to the disgruntled Egyptians, were all about the theatrics. Think flashy costumes, dramatic pronouncements, and disappearing acts, although some suspect that was just them ducking out for a toga 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 party. One famous Roman magician, the amazing Fabian, claimed he could turn water into wine. The crowd loved it, until they realized he'd just snuck out back and swapped the cups. Whoops. Moving on to the Middle Ages, things got a bit dark. Magic became synonymous with witchcraft, cauldrons full of dubious eye of newt stew, and pointy hats, which again, the hats lobbied heavily against. This was a rough time for magicians. Being accused of witchcraft could land you a one-way ticket to a fiery demise. It turns out defying physics is a lot less impressive when the stakes are that high. Thankfully, the Renaissance brought a brighter outlook. Science started to take center stage, but there was still a place for a little hocus pocus. Enter the alchemist. These folks were obsessed with turning lead into gold, which, let's be honest, sounds like a way better use of your time than arguing with a grumpy hat. Sadly, their methods were about as successful as convincing a mime to talk. Lots of explosions, zero gold. But hey, at least they invented some cool stuff along the way, like accidentally creating the recipe for Tang. By the 19th century, magic had shed its dark reputation and was back in the spotlight. The Victorians, with their love of all things mysterious, went wild for stage magicians. These guys were the ultimate showmen, pulling rabbits out of hats, much to the rabbits' continued dismay, sawing ladies in half, don't worry, they always came back together, and making elephants disappear, although that one usually involved a strategically placed curtain and a very confused elephant. Well, let me tell you a story about a magician named Magic Monty. So, that brings us almost to the present day. Magic has come a long way, from prehistoric bonks with sticks to disappearing acts that would make even Houdini jealous. But some classic tricks remain a mystery. Like, why the persistent popularity of, well, let's just say a certain furry friend and a very specific type of headwear? 
this enduring question deserves a closer look. Now, lights, camera, magic, mischief. The SS Abracadabra rumbled on the high seas, its passengers a rollicking mix of sunburnt tourists and bingo enthusiasts. But tonight, all eyes were on Montgomery Monty Magic, a once-renowned magician whose career had hit rockier waters than the current storm. Monty wasn't having a good night. Every flourish of his cape was met with stony silence, every dazzling display of sleight of hand drowned out by a squawk. Perched on a grumpy-looking man's shoulder, a parrot with a voice like a rusty hinge was Monty's nemesis. It's up his sleeve. The parrot would screech, shattering the illusion of Monty's disappearing handkerchief. Simple misdirection. It did mock after Monty's mind-reading trick. The audience, initially bewildered, found themselves erupting in laughter. Not at Monty's magic, but at the bird's scathing commentary. Monty's smile began to resemble a cracked eggshell. With a bead of sweat trickling down his forehead, he attempted his grand finale, predicting a chosen card. But before he could reveal his triumphant flourish, the parrot squawked. He led the audience to the answer with leading questions. A primal roar erupted within Monty. This wasn't entertainment anymore. It was torture by a feathered critic. In a moment of blind fury, Monty stormed off stage, muttering about revenge and an oddly specific craving for dynamite. That night, Monty lit the fuse to the dynamite. The next morning, the SS Abracadabra resembled a shipwrecked piñata. Splintered wood bobbed amongst the churning waves, the only survivors clinging to a lone door. Monty, with a singed beard and a sheepish look, and the parrot, inexplicably dry. An awkward silence stretched between them, punctuated only by the rhythmic lapping of the waves. Finally, the parrot cocked its head and squawked. All right, I give up. Where's the ship? <laughs> In our next funny story, we delve into the brain and the age-old phenomena of forgetfulness. In today's funny story joke, we're scratching our heads harder than a dog trying to understand a magic trick. It's all about the wonderful, mysterious, and sometimes frustrating human brain. We'll be joining Aunt Mildred and Uncle Melvin, a couple whose memories are about as reliable as a used flip phone. Get ready for some serious brain fumbles, but before we witness this comedic cognitive catastrophe, let's delve into the wacky world of aging brains. Buckle up, because things are about to get a little nutty. Our brains, like our favorite pair of jeans, experience some wear and tear as we age. Here's the science behind those memory lapses, delivered with a humorous twist. Imagine your brain as a bustling city. Information travels on highways, nerve fibers, between buildings, brain cells, using little mail carriers, neurotransmitters. These mail carriers deliver messages that make us remember our grocery list, hopefully, solve a crossword puzzle, maybe not, or even remember where we parked the car, unlikely. Now picture this city going through some renovations. With age, the highways, nerve fibers, get a little congested. The fatty insulation around them myelin sheath can deteriorate, slowing down message delivery. This is like rush hour traffic permanently messing with your mail service. Fewer mail carriers, neurotransmitters, are on the job. Our brains produce less of these chemical messengers, making it harder for messages to get from point A to point B. Imagine a postal worker shortage leading to a backlog of undelivered mail, memories. Some buildings, brain cells, might have fewer connections. The number of connections between brain cells, synapses, can decrease. This is like having fewer roads connecting different parts of your city, making it harder to get around and find things. Here's the funny part. You might start relying on the scenic route. With slower message delivery, your brain might take longer, more roundabout paths to find information. This explains why it takes forever to remember your neighbor's name but you can still recall every embarrassing moment from high school with crystal clarity. Thanks, brain. The to-do list gets lost in the mail. 
you might forget simple things because the message never reaches its destination. This is why writing things down becomes crucial, just like sticking a giant reminder note on your front door. Think of a young brain as a brand new, efficient city. Everything runs smoothly, information travels quickly, and you can remember everything from your dentist appointment to the lyrics of that catchy song you heard once. An older brain is like that same city after years of wear and tear. It still functions, but things might take a little longer and some deliveries might get lost along the way. The good news? Just like you can improve traffic flow in a city by adding new roads or optimizing routes, we can keep our brains sharp with mental exercises, staying socially active and even getting enough sleep. So, embrace the occasional memory lapse, laugh it off, and keep your brain city thriving. All right, folks, enough with the brain dissertations. Time to ditch the textbooks and dive headfirst into the hilarious world of senior forgetfulness. Today's joke stars Aunt Mildred and Uncle Melvin, a couple whose memories are about as sharp as a butter knife used to cut a brick. Buckle up, because we're about to witness a comedic cognitive catastrophe of epic proportions. Get ready to LOL so hard, you might just forget where you put your teeth. Don't worry, Aunt Mildred probably forgot too. An uncle and aunt, both pushing 90, were getting forgetful. They shuffled into the doctor's office, worried their memories were fading faster than their eyesight. The doctor gave them a clean bill of health, except for the usual aches and pains that came with eight decades on the planet. But it's not unusual to be forgetful at your age. Why not write things down you might forget? Later that night, the flickering light from the TV cast dancing shadows on the wall as Mildred knitted furiously. Suddenly, Melvin, her husband, lumbered to his feet with a gasp, like a man possessed. Aha! The craving strikes again! He boomed, his voice echoing in the quiet living room. Fear not, my sweet Mildred, for I, your valiant knight, shall venture forth into the perilous kitchen and vanquish the ice cream dragon. Will you bring me some ice cream with, dear? Yes, of course, darling. Maybe you should write it down. You know what the doctor said. What if you forget? No, I will remember. You want some ice cream? But I want chocolate sauce on the ice cream. Maybe you should really write is down. I will remember that my wife. You want chocolate sauce on your ice cream. But I want some of those small nuts on it as well. But you must write it down. You will forget. Yes, of course, darling. The uncle lumbered back into the living room, sweat beating on his forehead, a triumphant grin plastered on his face. He proudly presented Auntie with a plate, holding two perfectly fried eggs and a side of crispy bacon. Behold! He declared, his voice hoarse from exertion. After a harrowing journey through the treacherous fridge and a fierce battle with the stubborn spatula, I present breakfast. Auntie Mildred looked at the plate and said, And this is why I told you to write it down. Where is my toast? Like we promised, the best funny story is for last. Before we get going, we'd like to thank you for being with us. Please also have a look at our previous week's best funny stories. Okay, folks, here goes. Forget Mars versus Venus. It's more like socks versus laundry baskets. In today's cartoon story joke, The Age-Old Battle of the Sexes, scientists have debated for years. How different are men's and women's brains, really? Today, we're not just cracking open skulls, metaphorically, of course. We're going full-on Indiana Jones, venturing deep into the uncharted territory of male versus female thought patterns. Buckle up, folks, because we're about to witness the discovery of a mental artifact so powerful, so earth-shattering, it'll make you question everything you thought you knew about Laundry Day. Back in the day, science types thought the only difference between men's and women's brains came from life experiences. You know, like wives reminding their husbands to breathe occasionally 
insert dramatic fainting couch emoji here. But one guy, Nirao Shah, wasn't buying it. He was on a mission to find the real reason behind why some folks are champion shoppers and others get lost asking for directions. Hint, it's usually not the shoppers. So, he dug into genes and how they might influence these behaviors differently in men and women. This wasn't exactly a crowd pleaser at the Brain Research Society. It was like suggesting squirrels built the pyramids, except way less impressive. But Shaw was persistent, and guess what? Turns out, there might be some truth to that whole men are from Mars, women are from Venus thing after all. Fast forward to today, and science has a mountain of evidence. We've peeked inside brains, and let me tell you, they're not all wired the same way. Men's brains seem more into bro time activities like navigating with a map, hopefully, and picturing complex shapes like the perfect parking spot. Women's brains, on the other hand, excel at remembering details using language and maybe even multitasking, like remembering where they parked while chatting on the phone, for example. But hey, this isn't a competition. Think of them as specialized tools. A hammer is great for building a deck, but you wouldn't use it for brain surgery unless you're a very determined zombie. The kicker? These brain differences start early, way before pink versus blue toys even enter the picture. Even babies show preferences for certain activities. It's like nature is pre-programming us. But why the difference? Enter the hormone stage. During development, a testosterone surge in males shapes their brains differently than the estrogen symphony in females. It's like a cosmic jukebox playing different tunes for each sex. These hormonal differences might even explain why some disorders affect men and women differently, like why women are more prone to depression and anxiety, while men are more susceptible to alcoholism and autism. The science is still unfolding, but one thing's clear, our brains aren't one size fits all. Understanding these differences can help us appreciate our strengths, weaknesses, and maybe even explain why men never seem to understand those subtle hints women drop, like needing a new car. Just saying. Now, onto the real reason we're here. A couple of guys were in the dressing room, practically horizontal after a brutal golf game. A mobile phone starts to ring, and one of the guys answers it while putting it on speaker while he continues to get dressed. A woman over the speaker for everyone to hear said, Hi, honey. I am in town, and I found these wonderful pair of leather boots. You know those ones which I always wanted. How much? The guy asks for everyone to hear. The wife said, Well, it's a bit expensive. It's $500. Honey, you deserve it. Get it. And put it on the credit card. The man said. Then to the envy of all the guys, the wife said, Oh, and on my way here, I passed the Mercedes dealership, and they have one of those cabriolet sports cars, which you know we spoke about before. And it's in that color you like. You know they don't stick around for long on the showroom floor. Go buy it and make sure he gives you a good price on your vehicle. Negotiate hard, but get it. The guy said. To all the guy's amusement, as they are now filled with envy, the wife continued. Oh, and on the way here, the agent phoned for that holiday home we made an offer on. The sellers have dropped their asking price. Yes, I heard the couple was getting a divorce. Tell him we will take it and transfer the deposit. The guy said. The wife on the other end of the phone was very happy and said, OK, I will do all of it right away, and then we can have a wonderful time tonight. Cheers. The man took the phone from speaker, hung up, and continued to get dressed. All the men in the dressing room were filled with envy. As he was ready to leave the dressing room, the guy asked all the guys in the dressing room, Do any of you guys know who the idiot is that forgot his mobile phone here in the dressing room? <laughs> if you liked our joke, then please watch our next joke by clicking here. <laughs>